Can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and how much do you know about economics? I know that when money leaves my pocket, it disappears. So let's learn together through the lens of Wall Street Journal reporter and Pulitzer Prize finalist, John Hilsenrath. And is it Pulitzer? Anyway, for our TikTok Minute, what's the history of a 401k? One video explains. Kinda. And in the headlines, thousands of people can't access their annuities. What's going on? We'll share. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener. And of course, don't you worry, I'll share some Federal Reserve related trivia. And now, two guys who I promise won't be reserved about your money Joe and O. G. Hey there, stackers. We're going to try not to be reserved. We're going to bring it all out this week as if we didn't bring it before. We just thought we were bringing it before. That was just a warm-up. Today, the real show starts, because you know why? Across the card table, trying to keep a straight face here, Doug. <laughs> the last the 11 card- years <laughs> have just been a warm-up. For today, we say that every episode. We're like, okay, that might have been part of the warm-up, too. Because, uh, well, today, number one, we got Doug here. Number two, though, we got the OG across the card table from me. How are you, man? Got the me. Got the Ready me. Ready to bring it? Sure. We got... Uh, John Hilsenrath here from the Wall Street Journal. He's going to help us look at economics, like Doug said, through the eyes of a book that he wrote, which goes through. It's really interesting. He looks at it through the eyes of the only woman who has served as the head of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen. And he walks through the life of Janet Yellen and how she how she got where she is. But really, he back he goes back and forth between Janet and how economics works. And I realize reading it how little people know. And we usually don't go into this territory OG because economics ends up being politics. And I think John Hilsenrath even makes a good case for how muddled (laughs) our politics are. I thought that these two different parties were all about, you know, different economic beliefs. I think uh, John may, may pop a balloon in that too. So great show. Super happy that uh, John's here. We've been a big fan of his work at the Wall Street Journal for a long time. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. This uh, piece comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, OG, you found this one. This was written by Mark Merriman and Leslie Sism. Thousands of retirees can't withdraw savings invested in firms controlled by indicted financier Greg Lindbergh accounts worth $2.2 billion, mostly in North Carolina. Change. Yeah. Are frozen while legal battles rage. The entrepreneur says he offered a solution that was rejected. Turns out that uh, a lot of people, OG had money in annuities. This guy's the owner of these uh, annuity, these insurance companies and uh, their money's locked down. Uh, why'd you bring this one to the table? I just thought it was interesting about how the different layers of of people involved in your decision making and people involved in your money products can have secondary effects that you got to think about, you know? What happens if the insurance carrier goes under? You know, we just we were talking about banks that go under, what happens if the insurance company does? And this isn't necessarily going under, this is caught in a legal dispute over the state thinking that he's doing uh, or the Fed's thinking that the owner of this firm is embezzling tons of money and the state saying, well, you still got to pay out the money. And the Fed's going, well, he, we can't. We're not sure that whose money this is yet. And meanwhile, for years and years and years, folks are kind of trapped in the middle, which isn't very fair. Mark Zintel is one of those retirees caught in the middle. Uh, they open the piece with this. A retiree lives near Tampa, Florida. Furious that seven hundred thousand dollars in annuities he bought have been frozen for almost oh gee almost four years. He hasn't been able to get at his money. Yeah, could you imagine? You're in retirement. You you bought an annuity for the safety and security that comes with it, and 
It's nice and safe. It's so safe you can't touch it. <laughs> Reading through this piece, OG, a lot of these annuities, it appears, were fixed annuities, were fixed products, and they offered a higher interest rate than a savings account offers. So people bought them like they were a CD. And generally, I've seen this strategy. I've seen this strategy work for people before. If somebody is super, super, super conservative and they want to have money in a place where it's not going to have any market volatility, definitely not what I would do with my money, but maybe what very conservative grandma wants to do with hers. It seems to me, is it the, is this where doing some due diligence on what the insurance company is that you're actually investing through makes sense? Like what would have prevented this? What would have made this better for the people that are caught up in this? Yeah. I don't know that any sort of additional uh, investigation would have mattered because due diligence you know, one of the people not. that they, yeah, one of, one of the people they quoted in here or companies, apparently a lot of it was sold through a bank, through Citizens Bank in the Carolinas. And, and you would assume that they have a pretty robust compliance platform, a pretty robust due diligence platform to decide what products and what tools are available for their customers to, to interact with. Um, uh, so, you know, you assume that they did it. Um, you assume that the rep who sold them did a little bit of it and maybe even the consumers did, but none of that stopped the result, which is super frustrating. The piece says that a liquidation could be the third costliest U S life insurance failure association officials have made preliminary estimates that they might bill insurers nearly $1.5 billion to cover the shortfall, man, that's a bunch. Now, if they do go into liquidation, OG, let's talk about this. You know, often we'll see other insurance companies that pick up the assets, right? They pick up these contracts. An annuity is a yeah. contract. You might see another annuity company swoop in and get these contracts once they get out of trouble. Well, I think we can hope that that's the case. I, I think the biggest issue is the disconnect between, you know, what the feds are trying to do and prove and the state insurance board is advocating for the consumers you know, notwithstanding the fact that this person who is in charge, the owner of this company, may or may not have done all of the things that the feds are insinuating, I, I don't know a way around it. I don't know a way other than annuities suck. <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's an, another solution there. In fact, one of the closing parts of this was an advisory firm. So, you know, a financial planning firm that had sold some of these annuities to their customers, and they're being sued by one of their customers for not knowing that the default or that the freeze was about to happen oh. and not advising them to pull the money out. So even if you would have done the due diligence ahead of time and said, okay, reputable company or appears to be, they've passed all the background checks. They're registered by the state. Like everything is above board. This person is suing his insurance broker because they didn't see or pay attention to the fact that this was under investigation and should have continued to do ongoing due diligence, even though the, the sale had already happened. So that's just another layer of, of frustration, I think, you know, for everybody involved. You know, that, that asterisk that comes with insurance, whether it's property and casualty insurance or life insurance, or in this case, annuities, which are an insurance product, you know, it's subject to the claims paying ability of that insurance carrier. The company. You can have the greatest car insurance in the world, but if they decide they can't pay, then what do you got? You have to evaluate that as well. A piece in Forbes Advisor dives into the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the product we're talking about, the product type fixed annuities. First of all, it says these are the advantages, simplicity, guaranteed returns. You know, OG, they list guaranteed returns as an upside. You and I think guaranteed return is, for a lot of people, a downside. If you're investing for 10 years or more, and your return is guaranteed, it's probably a mistake, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, obviously, if you're guaranteeing an outcome, that means that there's no, you know, the upside's got to go to somebody and somebody else is getting the upside if you're getting the guarantees. They do list that for super duper conservative people. Your portfolio is not going to go anywhere and it's not going to go anywhere. I say that in a positive way and in a negative way, right? You just can put some yep. stank, stank on that or you can say it all all brightly. Uh, third is it's is predictability. 
where it's very easy to predict what your returns can be. Disadvantages, less upside, exactly what you talked about. Guaranteed returns eventually end. They only guarantee your minimum rate of return for a certain number of years. Man, how many times have you seen this? The lockup period in a fixed annuity is seven years, and the guarantee lasts for two. And the second that guarantee goes away, the annuity company immediately jacks that rate to the lowest rate ever, which is why you always have, if you are going to get into one of these products, you have to ask not what's the rate it's paying now. You have to ask what the minimum rate is. Yeah. Because I've seen that a bajillion times. Yeah. What's the calculation and how are they going to come up with it? And what's the frequency in which they're going to be making those changes? I think if you're going into one of these buyer beware, really know what you're doing, what you're after. Doug, you and I, we remember when OG left the room a couple of weeks ago, you and, yeah. you and I tackled a question and uh, you said, what's a red flag? I'm like, annuity's a red flag. I don't know that it's bad, but often if you see annuity, it, it means you, you really got to know what you're getting into. Reason to research more, reason to figure out, are you one of the rare circumstances where this makes sense? Absolutely. Time for our TikTok Minute. This is the part of the show where we dive into either some awesomeness or ridiculousness, ridiculous, easy for me to say, that a uh, TikTok purveyor has thrust upon the universe. How about that, huh? Wow. This TikTok Minute was sent to us by Stacker Debbie. Debbie said, hey, um, Little Debbie? you guys should, uh, I love, I love Debbie's snack cakes. Debbie's got the best snack cakes. I haven't had I haven't had a little Debbie snack cake in a long time. Does she make the are they like strawberry or raspberry yes. with coconut on the outside? Oh, Holy sh those are I know good. you can have those. You can have all those. I'll take just oh. the little square cakes and, and and they come like in a box and there's two per like little foil thing. And I, I haven't will, had lunch yet, fellas. I will just eat the whole box. I'll just eat the whole box. No lunch. Or breakfast. Anyway. Doug, we know what OG would say. Uh, this one's actually a Facebook reel. It's not even, maybe we can ask OG because this is a Facebook thing. So I know what you feel about TikTok. What do you think about a Facebook reel? Is this ridiculousness or awesomeness that Debbie sent us? The Facebook? The Facebook. The Facebook machine. Um, I think the Facebook reel is um, probably ridiculous, obviously. Well, let's see uh, what Debbie's got here. This is a person who runs a financial firm talking about 401ks. 401k was never meant as a big retirement plan. A 401k was developed because after the depression, people were not getting back into the stock market. So they created a 401k to make it easy for the average person to get into the stock market. So you really got to do some research. I mean, everybody, all of us need to really do our research when we're looking at just blindly accepting advice from somebody. So I don't think today you can save yourself to retirement. I mean, the interest rates, 2%. Right. It was it was almost negative because it was zero something. And the fees you're paying is brings you negative. Um, so if you're saving money, are you trying to build as big a nest egg as possible to live off of? And who knows what's going to happen with inflation, deflation? There's so many factors. So I don't think saving and a 401k is a good financial retirement plan at all. Like I'm going to literally say all of the buzzwords that I can think of in one run-on sentence. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not the great depression it's the 1970s uh, uh number two it's so funny when she said i, thought, I like the they i like the they part well they I created she was going. it they, they created it those evil people they the evil the evil people well, and to get back yeah, people into the stock market people weren't in the stock market the stock market was for the rich people was for wealthy people before the great depression there was anybody in the you know the the, the average and dude it's like doug told us you know, the 401k started in the late seventies during a really crappy market time. It wasn't like they had already gone. They had already been in the market. <laughs> I don't know. They, yeah. And you know, the fees and the stuff and you can't trust anybody. And 
with the stuff with the things and it's bad. I thought, oh, gee, where she was going with that is, hey, listen, you got to do your research. You got to dig in. You can't just trust one person. When you research this stuff, you'll find out I'm completely full of shit with revisionist history. <laughs> like, I'm making all this up. Like, why is she encouraging anybody to do due diligence when nothing she says is correct? Like, none of those. Oh, quote, I'm guessing facts. that this was going down the path of insurance. Yes. She finished with savings and investing. Saving and 401k is a horrible retirement plan. What the hell are you supposed to do? Buy life insurance. Yes. Bank on yourself life insurance. She's selling insurance. Uh, Unless, of course, that insurance company is run by a criminal who embezzles money, in which case you can't have that money either. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, the great ones bring it full circle like OG just did. Yeah. I've got an insurance company in North Carolina you should get involved with. It's going great for them. Debbie, thanks for sending that to us. So, Joseph, that's two Mondays in a row that your crack staff of prognosticators have correctly predicted the outcome of the real we we were shared. You guys are genius. Just geniuses. Yeah. Everybody. (laughs) Pay raise. It's amazing. (laughs) Bonus. We will talk about why 401ks uh, can be a fantastic place to save and how to best use a 401k and even how best to use insurance in our guide to the show, which frankly, even if you miss an episode is a great, great resource. We dive deeper into the topics that are on this podcast every Tuesday, Thursday with our newsletter called the 201. It's always free. Subscribe whenever stackybenjamins.com slash 201. All right, coming up next, man, I've been so excited to talk about this guy who has a new book out that ostensibly was about Janet Yellen. And when I started reading about it, yes, you're going to learn about Janet Yellen, but you know what you're going to learn about even more? You're going to learn about the two main schools of thought that are constantly fighting this economic battle back and forth. And what are the differences between the two? Well, John Hilsenrath is the perfect guy to write this story because he was a Pulitzer. How about that, Doug? Is that better? I c- I cut. Uh, that's not right. I, I've had our research staff look up how to pronounce it. And I was right originally. It's Pulitzer. No, it's Pulitzer. Neither of us were right. I, I said Pulitzer because it's fun to say poo. But, <laughs> but it's Paul. <laughs> you say it's Pulitzer. Pul- that's Pulitzer. the correct. According to our research staff, it's Pulitzer. Well, like I said, a Pulitzer Prize finalist ah. in 2014. Well, he, he was up for the Pulitzer and he won the Pulitzer. <laughs> what if they were competing awards? I don't know. Okay. He was a, he was a Pulitzer prize finalist. I just so funny. John's such a great guy and I'm just killing his introduction finalist in 2014 for coverage of the federal reserve. He's been part of a wall street journal team for a long, long, long time, twice voted among the nation's most influential financial journalists. We quote him quite often, John Hills and wrath upstairs talking to mom. About ready to head down the stairs while Doug, Doug, maybe you got some appropriate trivia for us? Appropriate? Well, what's the point of me even doing it if it's got to be appropriate? <laughs> I'm going to just do the trivia and you you can decide if it's appropriate. I hope it's not appropriate. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And in the spirit of a great discussion coming up about economics and Janet Yellen, I thought we'd share some Federal Reserve related trivia. Which of these interest rates is most closely tied to changes in the Fed fund rate? Mortgage rates, treasury bill yields, or auto loan interest rates? I'll be back with the answer and John Hilsenrath in just a moment. Hey there, stackers. I'm future economics professor and the guy who puts the nay in Monet, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The Fed funds rate is the only way the Federal Reserve is able to help guide the economy. So our question was, which of these three is more directly affected by the Federal Reserve interest rate movement? Is it the interest rate on mortgages, the yield you earn on a treasury bill, or the amount you pay on an auto loan? The answer? Treasury bills are sold at auction, with the interest rate rising if nobody buys. So while Federal Reserve moves could potentially affect T-bills, it's not a direct movement. Mortgage rates are based on T-bill interest rates. So again, 
The Fed may influence what you pay and probably will, but it's also secondary. That means, believe it or not, your auto loan, which is most often paid to a bank, is much more directly affected when the Fed changes the interest rate banks have to pay because the bank likely will pass any increases onto you. There's your primer. Wait, is it primer? Now let's get into it with John Hilsenrath from the Wall Street Journal. And here he is taking a seat at the card table. John Hilsenrath is here. How are you, man? Uh, I'm really good, and I'm really happy to be here. I, I think I'm in your mother's basement. It's uh, very happy to be here. <laughs> He's like, where am I? Where did I get kidnapped? How did I end up? I, I thought I was writing for the Wall Street Journal. Now I'm in Texarkana. I don't know what's going on. I, I, Joe, I've been in much stranger places, so, uh, <laughs> so, so I'm good with this. Uh, why you and why this project, John? Because I find this a very interesting study, not just of Janet Yellen and how the Fed works, but also of just economics in general. Why did you decide to take this on? Well, you know, when Janet Yellen was nominated by Joe Biden to be Treasury Secretary, it was obvious to me that this is a historic figure. She's now Treasury Secretary, former Fed chair, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisor, the first person in American economic history to have those three jobs. And so then the question was like, how do you write a story that people want to read? What makes her narrative worth hearing? What occurred to me is that there's a love story here and a love story that I could use as a vehicle to tell a bigger economic story. So Yellen is married to George Akeloff, a Nobel Prize winner in his own right. And between the two of them, they've been in, in the middle of almost every major economic debate over the last 60 years and so what occurred to me in the shower is if I, I could use them as the central characters to tell a much bigger and broader story about American economic upheaval, which is what I've been covering as a finance and economics writer at the Wall Street Journal for the last 26 years. So Yellen, I guess, is another way of saying she became selfishly my vehicle. I wanted to tell a bigger story and use her as a vehicle through which to do that. Well, and it's funny, John, when you say love story, there's obviously the love story you mentioned, but I also picked up when I was reading it, there's another love story going on here. And I don't think this is by accident. This woman loves, loves economics. Like there's a love story between her and just the practice of economics going on as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think for a lot of people who kind of seek satisfaction in their work, that's what you're looking for, right? You're looking to do something that you find meaningful and purposeful. And she found that through economics. You know, I think as we all know, people say pursue your passion. Well, it's not like she jumps out of bed every morning, kind of raring to go and excited. <laughs> a lot of days, the work that we do can be a hard grind, but it was something that she was drawn to because she it, it made her feel purposeful. And so you're right. Uh, there, there is a love story also and not only in her family story, but in the work she chose to do. And, you know, we could have a long discussion and debate about whether she's done it well. I think because, you know, the, the country is so partisan now, there are people who want to kind of say she's either great or a failure. You know, she's, you know, you're either red or you're blue. Uh, what I tried to do is get beyond that stuff and use her as an actual character to tell this, this bigger story. She's made mistakes and she's also made some good calls. People will come down either side, not just because of politics, but also because of which economic camp they live in. And you dive into these two very different thought processes people have, these underlying core values that these two different economic theories have. And I want to dive into that, but I want to start kind of where you start. You pick up your story in 2009 in your introduction. Janet Yellen's running the San Francisco Fed. Most of our stacker community, John, have no idea how the Fed's organized. What was the head of the San Francisco Federal Reserve responsible for? What was she doing at this point in 2009? Well, so let me say the San Francisco Fed is one of 12 regional Fed banks. Uh, the way the Fed is structured is there's 12 banks spread around the country. And then there's a Fed board in Washington where their Fed chair resides. And the Fed is set up this way for a reason. You know, there's a long history of distrust in this country, dating all the way back to the debates between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson about the creation of the first bank of the United States. There's a long history of distrust towards financial institutions. 
And when the Fed was created in 1913, that distrust was very much present. And they decided they didn't want all the power concentrated in Washington or New York. So they created these 12 regional Fed banks. Yellen uh, and her husband, George Akeloff, had been professors at the University of California, Berkeley. And she was named to be president of the San Francisco Fed. Uh, you can't hold me to these dates. I think it was around 2004, 2005. And so she was overseeing this vast swath of the West, uh, not only monitoring the economies, but also playing a role in supervision of banks. And a lot of the banks that were heading towards serious trouble during the mortgage boom of the late 2000s uh, were out West. Uh, there, my book documents some interesting confrontation she had with the CEO and founder of Countrywide Financial, uh, the mortgage company that ended up blowing up. And so she was kind of like the eyes and the ears for the Fed in the West. And she would go to these Fed policy meetings eight times a year and kind of report uh, to other Fed officials. And she did such a good job, at least that they felt at the Fed, of kind of laying out what was coming that they asked her to come to Washington to be the vice chair of the Fed in 2010. Well, the scene that you go to to make your point there is this Fed meeting. You write that Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, is running the meeting. By the way, you describe him as a, quote, socially awkward genius who has <laughs> this huge task of helping the country through this really huge crisis. And they're looking at all this data that shows the economy is picking up. But yet when he calls on Yellen, John, she reports that in San Francisco, it doesn't feel like a recovery. And it seems like she seems at this point in the game, and man, I remember 2009 like it was yesterday, and there's these critical moves I felt like that needed to be made or maybe didn't need to be made. And if we make them, are we going too far? Are we not going far enough? But she seemed to be squarely in the, we need to lower interest rates further camp, yeah. period. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so people ask me sometimes, well, what's her legacy? What did she actually do in these jobs that makes her matter? And I think like you're putting your finger on that period. So we had this financial crisis that kind of rolled through the financial system from 2007 into well into 2008. By the summer of 2009, uh, Barack Obama is elected president. There's this hope in Washington that the worst of the crisis is over and a recovery can set in. And Yellen is there at these Fed meetings saying, no, like, you know, we've gotten through the financial crisis, but we have another crisis on our hands, and that's an unemployment crisis. You said, by the way, John, that she and, and, and she doesn't give this off and her public persona that I've seen that she would get really passionate about stuff. But you you, yeah. you have a different character here, one that really is forceful and, and can be very passionate. Yeah, yeah. She surprised a lot of people at the Fed. And in fact, she really upset some staff because she was so determined to pursue these policies that the Fed pursued after the financial crisis ended. You know, the, this phrase QE, quantitative easing, this was the Fed's efforts to bring down long-term interest rates, which was really pushed after the crisis ended. And she was very much at the center of pushing for those policies. Now, there was a lot of controversy about doing that. And that's where she stepped out on a limb and became one of uh, Ben Bernanke's strongest advocates to push these levers to, to keep working to get unemployment down. You transition into this discourse about two economists, Robert Schiller and George Akerlof, who you mentioned later was, was her husband. Talk about these two people, though, and why they appear in the book. For a couple of reasons. One is because they're characters. They're just really interesting <laughs> people. You know, like one of my favorite stories in this book is Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner, Schiller is just a skeptic. He doesn't like when people mislead him. To give you a sense of what a character he is, Schiller's got a cat and he buys his cat food and the, the, the cat food says gourmet cat food. And Schiller's like, gourmet cat, like what's gourmet to a cat? It's like, I think they're lying in their marketing. He lays out gourmet cat food versus regular cat food and tastes them to see if there's any difference. Now, I don't know if a cat taste buds are different than a human taste buds, but he concludes that the pet food makers are lying because the gourmet pet food tastes just the same as the regular pet food. But this brings me to a broader point, which is that Schiller and Akerlof both set out from very young ages to challenge the idea that, that markets are efficient, you know, which is really the kind of you, you talked about kind of uh, Chicago school economics. 
the foundation of Chicago school economics is the idea that markets are efficient, that they're, they're the best way of distributing kind of goods and work through the economy is to let markets left to their own devices. And they both said, no, markets aren't efficient. You know, just look at the stock market. Like this is the most kind of the deepest, richest stock markets in the world. And Schiller concluded it's wildly inefficient. And so Akerlof and Schiller kind of were two leading proponents in the idea that there's more to the way this capitalist system works than the orthodoxies had led us to believe. When you say Chicago School of Economics, I want to talk about this for a second. They call it Chicago School of Economics because of Milton Friedman. Is that why? Yeah, because a lot of the leading lights in the kind of free market view of, of economics were at the University of Chicago in the 1950s and 60s. I think what I ought to do is back up a little bit. And this is where the book becomes a modern economic history. You know, so much of our thinking about events and where we stand today is kind of rooted in history. And the world that Janet Yellen was born into uh, in the 1950s was a post-Great Depression world. And the guy who defined the post-Depression era was John Maynard Keynes. Keynes is this British economist who, by the way, as I lay out in my book, happened to be a bit of an anti-Semite. You know, Keynes came to the view that markets can't be left to their own devices and that when they were left to their own devices, we had this the Great Depression and the government has a role to play to move the economy forward when it gets stuck in uh, these overinvestment booms or credit busts. Friedman comes along after the Great Depression, you know, and when socialism is really sweeping through Europe and has already kind of swept through the Soviet Union. And Friedman comes to the conclusion that you know, these views of socialism and Keynesianism of government's heavy hand in the economy is going too far. And he led a counter movement. And the counter movement to Keynesianism was, you know, this idea that that markets are best left to their own devices, that when you let markets function and don't interfere with them, they distribute goods efficiently, they hold inflation down, and they create the most jobs and the most prosperity for the most people. And really what we had for decades in that post-Depression period were these great philosophical debates between people like Milton Friedman and then the people who followed Keynes, who happened to be the mentor of Janet Yellen and George Akerlof, people like Jim Tobin and Paul Samuelson, who believed that the government had some role to play to help get the economy through, through downturns. And that really defined the politics of the post-Great Depression era you know, what is the role of government in managing the economy? And we still have those debates today. They've gotten somewhat muddied, I would say. Well, no. So on that note, we've got the Chicago School, which I think a lot of people also call supply side economics, right? Yeah. Those are just different terms, I think, for the same type of thing. It and kind of have- is, but supply side, is a, it's a strange term, you know. So, I mean, as you know, you know, a market is based of supply and demand. People consume goods and businesses produce them. And so, you know, the Keynesian movement was all about stimulating demand when the economy gets stuck in a rut. And the Friedmanites were saying, no, we need to support the creation of more supply. Okay, I understand that. But what they came to be defined as in the Reagan era is cut taxes and, and reduce regulation. But there are a lot of factors that go into supply, you know, yeah. for instance, you know, if, if when the government invests in, in creating new airports, is that expanding supply? You know, that's why I, I kind of um, push back a little bit on the idea that um, supply side economics is the same thing as free markets. It gets a little complicated when you go there. It is interesting how, though, people will use those terms interchangeably. And to your point, yeah. they probably aren't. Uh, you mentioned this other character you just brought up, which is Tobin. How did she get to know Tobin as a mentor? Oh, yeah. You know, he had a huge effect on her. So Yellen is born in Brooklyn in the 1950s. Uh, her mother is a Jewish mother who nagged her children all the time, not only to get their homework done, but to make sure that they got their homework done properly. So Yellen became somewhat neurotic as a child about doing all of her homework. Her father was a medical doctor. They sat around the dinner table in Brooklyn and, and talked about his patients. 
problems like unemployment and how it affected an entire household, how it affected mental health or substance abuse or divorce. And so Yellen grew up with this view that unemployment was a problem. She also happened to be really good at math. She goes to Brown, by the way, schools like Yale and Princeton weren't admitting women back then. One of the big surprises to me in reporting this book was just what a different world talented young women lived in uh, who wanted to have a career. She gets only one B in all of her studies, which is in German. And then she goes off to Yale to get her PhD. And she's the only woman in her PhD class at Yale in the 1960s. And she is blown away by Jim Tobin. So Jim Tobin had worked in Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors. He was this brilliant guy who had served in World War II. And he was a passionate individual uh, who believe strongly that in the ideas of Keynes, uh, in the idea that economics was not just this kind of abstract science, that it could be used to improve the condition of humans, and that if the government kind of behaved prudently, that it could do things to help people who lost jobs. And Yellen became a devoted follower, not just of Keynes, but also of Tobin. There's this one passage in the book where Milton Friedman from the Chicago School comes uh, to give a talk at Yale in the 1960s, you know, kind of espousing his views about how the government needs to just get out of the way. And Tobin challenges Friedman right there in person. And Yellen is right next to Tobin. She becomes really angry and agitated about Friedman's responses because she doesn't think that Friedman is giving straight answers. So she was right there in the front row of these great debates that were kind of set off by John Maynard Keynes after the Great Depression. That was early in her career. I think she would say that what she's discovered as a policymaker, which started in the 1990s, is that getting the right thing done is a huge challenge. There are so many obstacles to prudent government action. Um, And a lot of her work life has been about fighting through those obstacles to try to get to good economic decisions that sometimes what you think is right in theory, it's very hard to achieve for any number of reasons, you know, some of which is hard to know what's right. And then the other is just the political obstacles are are immense. It's interesting, John, that in a lot of ways, she's lockstep with Keynes and Tobin. And by the way, you mentioned just offhand Keynes anti Semitism. I had never heard that before. And you walk into some of that, that just some awful, absolutely horrible, horrible, e- even about Albert Einstein, for goodness sake. I mean, the guy yeah. was just, I don't know. Uh, yeah, for, you know, like that, that was kind of the way people talked in his day, particularly in, in the UK. And I think some people kind of want to excuse him for it because, you know, he was such an important figure in economics, but you know, like we, we just tend to paint people in black and white images. And I think everybody is a fascinating character worth examining in full. I think the, the world is much more complex and interesting than that. And I find the really good stories happen when you examine the shades of gray. Well, and absolutely. I mean, if, if you've got Janet Yellen growing up in a Jewish family who is following the philosophy of a guy who's an anti-Semite, I mean, there, there, there it is right there. But that leads me to my question. So you have her lockstep at this point with Keynes and with Tobin. How has she grown into really her own economic figure versus some of these larger than life people that came before her? That's a really, really good question. You know, I, I think a lot of people would argue that even to this day, she's really kind of a a, a textbook Keynesian. But I would say that where she's grown is because she's had to put these theories in practice, she's come to understand that the work of a policymaker is prone to mistake and misjudgment and failure in the same way that the work of a market participant is prone to mistake and misjudgment and failure, which is so interesting because what her husband, George Akerlof, set out to do in his career was to demonstrate that markets are prone to mistake, misjudgment and failure. And he won his Nobel Prize for that. 
And uh, I, I think Yellen has discovered in her career just how hard the job of a policymaker is too. And the most stark example of that is is on inflation, right? So one of her first wake-up calls in the 1970s was, you know, a lot of the ideas of Keynesians were discredited during the 1970s because the government had pursued all these stimulative policies and it led to an outbreak of sustained double-digit inflation. And, you know, one of the kind of big intellectual challenges to Keynesianism was this idea of um, rational expectations that like if people start believing there's going to be inflation in the future, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and the government's job becomes much harder. And, and, you know, this was kind of in some ways a rejection of some of Tobin's ideas. And Yellen accepted that and became what was called a new Keynesian you know, and then now as Treasury Secretary, her biggest the biggest stain on her record as a policymaker is another outbreak of inflation as Treasury Secretary for the Biden administration. And that's going to really, I think, ultimately define her legacy, whether they get inflation under control. You know, I think she's turning to the ideas that you know were really advanced by Paul Volcker, that you have to have a central bank that's tough. And that's going to stop inflation in its track before people believe that it's like embedded throughout the economy. I think this explains for people, too, as we get clear on these two schools of thought, the Keynesian school of thought and the Chicago school of thought, why Donald Trump let Janet Yellen go. Obviously, he's surrounding himself with much more Chicago school of thought people. Tell me this. You mentioned that she didn't want to be Treasury Secretary. Did she turn it down? Yeah, the first time Biden's emissaries approached her, she said no. She was happy with her re- retirement well into her 70s and um, didn't feel like she had another run into her. So she said no, and then they, they came back to her, and she and her husband George and son Robbie talked about it in the kitchen, and they decided that she had a duty. There was another economic crisis with COVID, and when the president asks you to do a job, You do it. You serve. So she decided to do it. But Joe, I want to challenge you on something you said, which is that Trump let her go and surrounded himself with people with more of a Chicago school view of the world. I'm going to disagree with that. I I, I think the orthodoxies of the post-Depression era have broken down in uh, the post-millennial era. A great example of that is where did President Trump stand on trade? A free market view of the world would be that trade is good, that everyone is better off with free trade, uh, and that you should have kind of open markets, even open borders. Trump challenged that. Trump also spent very aggressively when COVID happened. You know, it, it was the Trump administration first that sent out relief checks to millions and millions of households. The government was exceptionally interventionist in the COVID period. And so I think we're living in a new era in which the the orthodoxies of the post-depression era, these great debates between government and markets have evolved into something much different. Right now, they're being defined by simply, you know, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? But I think the philosophical underpinning of how we think about and manage the economy is changing pretty dramatically right now. And even at Chicago, the Chicago school is not the Chicago school anymore. So, you know, these old orthodoxies are changing under our our feet. And this becomes really one of the defining themes of the book. So we had 60 years of debate about the proper role of government and markets in society and the economy. And what I come away thinking is... The the book is about a marriage, right? But it's also about another marriage. It's about the marriage between free markets and democratic government. Yeah. And what we've discovered in this 60-year period is that neither side is perfect. Both sides are populated by humans that are prone to misjudgment and mistake and overshooting. And that the, the challenge of our times has been finding the right mix of uh, democratic governance, and market capitalism. Uh, And and that mix, what holds the mix together is the institutions of society, the institutions that our founders built 
after the Revolutionary War, a court system that people trust, a free media that people trust, police that people trust, uh, rules of commerce that people trust. And for me, the, the biggest challenge of our times is the fact that trust in these institutions is broken down in the midst of all the turbulence that we've lived through in the last 20 years. You know, when we look at countries like Russia and China, which in their own ways have rejected the marriage we thought that they would embrace, a marriage of free markets and democratic capitalism. They both had their chance right when the Berlin Wall fell and after Tiananmen Square. We tried to bring them into our system and, and get them to embrace our system. And the last 20 years, we've discovered that they're not going to do that. And, and we've discovered that the way they do it has its pitfalls. If we look at them as a, as a mirror into ourselves, the founders, Alexander Hamilton talked about this. There's not some great nirvana where everything is perfect. It has to be, as in any marriage, it has to be worked at. And the challenges that you come up against as your marriage evolves, you got to keep working at fixing these things. And it needs a lot of support and a lot of patience. And I, I'm afraid our marriage right now is in an unhealthy place because of the social and political divides that we're living through and the distrust. And I think like for me as a journalist, every day I'm working at like, how do you address that? How do you deal with that? How do you conduct yourself in a way that earns the right of people who look at you or listen to you and immediately think that you've got an agenda and you're trying to mislead them? Well, I'm glad you challenged me on that, John, because I firmly believe that. What I really, what I really enjoyed about this discussion and that I enjoyed in your book is it is a discussion about these philosophies. And you and I said this before we hit record today that I think most of us don't have any idea what the hell these underlying philosophies are that we supposedly believe in when we say that we're for this or we're for that. And so often even our country's leaders muddy the waters by, you know, Trump acting in a very Keynesian way <laughs> to, yeah, to exert right. government control and then getting rid of the Keynesian in his government to replace with, with somebody else. It's a, it's yeah. a, and, that, and that's why I also push you on the idea of supply side economics. It's like, so it, it, it's come to mean cut taxes and deregulate. But like, if you want to expand the supply side of the economy, there's like, there's other ways to do that. Those aren't the only two levers to pull. And I think that theoretically, uh, in many ways, our, our leaders in media and in government are kind of adrift right now. We had these great debates about whether we should have more government or more market. And I think in some ways we've come to the conclusion that both sides are imperfect. But then the next step of the debate is how do we fix and repair and improve the institutions that keep both sides of the equation honest? The book is Yellen, the trailblazing economist who navigated an era of upheaval we just skimmed the surface. We just barely skimmed the surface of what you had. A job well done, man. Thank you so much for talking a little bit about economics and Janet Yellen and really where we're headed. Thanks. This was fun. I'm Andy Dwyer. And when I'm not pulling suckers off my tomato plants in my garden, I'm stacking Benjamins. Oh, gee, I love these walks through history and just fascinating the two schools of thought. Chicago School, Keynesian economics. Big thanks to John for giving us those two pillars, which to his point in Washington have now been thoroughly muddied. <laughs> like, who yeah. believes what? He's like, yeah, yeah, we might be a little all over the place. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends OG at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. A surprise birthday party that I've got planned. For yourself? No. You surprised a surprise? Oh my God, I'm so surprised. I'm so surprised. A, nope. a new car. Nope, we're, planning, we're planning a surprise birthday party, <laughs> trying to keep it a secret. It's hard to do. Okay. I think broadcasting it to hundreds of thousands of people on this show is probably not a successful approach. What could go wrong when you say Keeping it, it a secret. Oh, that's a microphone. Oh, I had no idea. Is this thing on? <laughs> It is your loved ones and your time and the amount of time now they have to pretend that they have no idea what's coming. They have no idea. Why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote at Haven Life. 
They're issuing insurance the modern way. They have slashed the application to only the important pieces. It's simple. It's online. You get instant coverage decision, affordable prices, all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual. We talked about knowing the company you're dealing with. More than 160-year-old insurer, Mass Mutual. StackyBenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Burton. Say hi, Burton. Hi, Joe and OG. This is Burton from Minnesota. We are now able to save about 85000 a year, more than half of which goes to traditional 401k, Roth IRA, spousal IRA, and HSA. In the past, we have put any excess into taxable brokerage accounts in 529s. I recently learned my company offers mega backdoor Roth. Should I put most of my excess savings into that if we don't have any large anticipated expenses over the next few years? We have an emergency fund, brokerage account, home equity, and 10 years of Roth contributions to pull from if needed. So I'd like to stuff the Roth IRA through mega backdoor until the earlier of that no longer being an option from a job or law change or retirements accounts reach a point where we can reduce or stop contributions and coast. We'd love to hear your thoughts. See ya. Can I just start by saying Burton's Minnesota accent was really not that good. He's he's clearly a transplant. I think he was faking it. (laughs) Burton, you're not real. You're not really Minnesota. He's, he's, he's truly in some other part of the country pretending he's, he's throwing him off. Maybe Burton's right. planning a surprise birthday party, trying to throw him off. I can't get around the words. Can we just say this out loud? The elephant in the room, mega backdoor Roth IRA. Like just every time I hear it, we should have had a better name. OG just because all I hear is Burton going, yeah, I'm looking at that sexy mega backdoor and I just want to stuff it. <laughs> like if I could just stuff that mega back door, Roth IRA, <laughs> we gotta be, it's just a bridge too well, let's, far, let's, man. Let's name it something different. We should. Name it uh, Doug's mom. <laughs> <laughs> See, now it all makes sense. <laughs> it rolls right off the tongue. Just when you thought the show couldn't get worse. <laughs> Now say what Burton said, but insert the words Doug's mom instead. (laughs) Hold on. Hold on. In the past, we have put any excess into taxable brokerage accounts in 529s. I recently learned my company offers mega backdoor Roth. I recently learned my company offers Doug's mom. (laughs) Should I put most of my excess savings into that if we don't have any large anticipated expenses over the next few years? We have an emergency fund, brokerage account, home equity, and 10 years of Roth contributions to pull from if needed. So I'd like to stuff the Roth IRA through mega backdoor. <laughs> stuff it through Doug's mom. Doug's mom. Oh my. <laughs> Until the earlier that no longer being an option from a job or law change or retirements accounts reach a point where we can reduce or stop contributions and coast. We'd love to hear your thoughts. See ya. <laughs> Burton had no idea he was going to have the call of the year. <laughs> He's asking a straightforward question. All right, OG, let's try to keep it together, man, and help him out. How 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 does he how does he get this done? A hundred percent. If you have the option to do the excess contribution in one's four hundred one k, a la the mega back door. You should do that as much as possible. I mean, in practicality, what it is, is you are putting money into your 401k without a tax deduction of any kind. So you get to the 22.5, which is the maximum this year. Some companies and some plans allow you to do more money. That is an after-tax contribution. So there's no benefit to the money going in from a tax standpoint. While it sits there, it grows tax-deferred. And then you pay taxes on the distribution of the gains. But what most people do is put in all the extra money that they possibly can, if they're you know going to take advantage of this, put the extra money that they can, there's no tax benefit. And then at the end of the year, or the beginning of the next year, rather, take all of those contributions out, roll them into a Roth IRA, which you have to pay taxes on any gains that you made, which is going to be really little because it's only been there for half a year or three months or whatever. Whatever amount, yeah. And now you have just basically stuffed your Roth IRA with more money than than the Roth IRA limits allow. You will run into a maximum contribution number, which is somewhere in the 60K range this year. 
between your contributions, your employer matching contributions, non-deductible contributions, which is what this is, you know, there's a, there's a maximum limit there of 60 some odd thousand, but more likely than not, your company will have a maximum of the amount that they will allow you to do in excess. So they may say, well, we'll let you do another 10% or we'll let you do another 15% or, or a a fixed dollar amount, another 10,000 or something like that. But if you have the flexibility and, and because of all those other things, right, fully funded cash reserve, some excess contributions that have already gone into brokerage accounts that's accessible. Tax-free money forever is a great thing. So if you have the ability to do it, absolutely stuff as much as you can into no, no. the mega backdoor Roth IRA, no. a.k.a. Oh, gee, and I want to give everybody a warning here. Doug's mom. <laughs> I want to give everybody a warning, too. And this is not, I don't even like the double entendre of, of where this is going to go. So I don't want this. I don't want the unintended double entendre here. You don't want to get halfway done. You don't want to, you don't want to just have it after tax and sit there in your 401k. That creates a mess. If you put money in after tax, OG, it's, you got to finish the deal and make it a mega backdoor Roth IRA. And roll it out. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It just complicates the tax. Like you're saying, it just makes it complicated from a distribution standpoint because now you have to tell the IRS how much of this is taxable, how much of it is not. And the record keeping is incumbent on you. So it's just it just makes it a lot easier just to once a year in January, just call up your 401k provider, tell them you want to roll out the after-tax contribution into a Roth, no penalties for doing that. You'll get a 1099 for the gains for the you know that previous period. Uh, but it should be pretty low. So yes, if you have the opportunity to contribute extra money into a Roth IRA, this is the way to do it. And uh, you will not be angry with having too much tax-free money. No, no. And by the way, boy, congratulations on being able to save that much money. Yeah, that's great. That is, uh, wow, wow. How he lives on the other $4,000 a year he makes is beyond me. (laughs) That's right. It's just incredible. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for the call, Burton. You know what? We're sending Burton some sweet swag, our Stacking Benjamin's Greatest Money Show on Earth shirt. And if you'd like one too, just ask your question to OG. StackingBenjamins.com slash voicemail gets you there. We'll try not to uh, stop partway through the answering of the question for the diversion we had today. (laughs) Try to just actually get through it. But um, yeah, I hope that was helpful, Burton. And uh, good luck with the savings. StackingBenjamins.com slash voicemail. All right, that's going to do for today. Man, let's go to the community calendar. There is a lot that is always happening in the basement. And for a full guide, go to StackingBenjamins.com slash welcome. And that's a guide with links to all the different places where you can follow us. We do different uh, types of shows on different platforms. We do Instagram lives. We have different videos on our YouTube page. We have, of course, the 201 newsletter and much, much more. StackingBenjamins.com slash welcome gets you there. Also got to say a big thanks to people who've left us a review. This one is from non-space girl. Five stars, the most entertaining finance podcast by far. Wow. I always look forward to listening to SB podcast. I love all the cast and characters and their personalities. It's one of the rare finance theme podcasts that my 12 year old would actually enjoy listening to while in the car. Oh boy. Maybe I shouldn't read that one today. Is that a compliment? Keep up the good, the good work guys. We're very big in the 12 year old market in the the (laughs) pre-adolescent market. We're capturing the, it sounds like we're 12 years old ourselves today Mm -hmm. sometimes, but thank you so much for that. And if uh, you're somebody that leaves a total stranger a review about the podcast, which we love, uh, thank you so much. You're my kind of, my kind of person, non-space girl. All right. That's it for us, but that's not it for you. You know what? If you're not here for any of that, you're here because of the fact that you're worried about economic conditions Good day to tune into our podcast with John Hilsenrath, kind of giving you the what's what on that. And you might be feeling anxious that you should be making some moves in your finances. What I want you to do instead is check out this free guide OG and his team put together that'll help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. 
It is some great insights on what you should be doing and smart questions to ask yourself so you'll make financial decisions your future self will thank you for. Head over to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide to get that free guide from OG. All right, that is it. We generally try to give you five or six things that you learn, but Doug, what are our top three, man? Well, Joe, number one, we learned something not so shocking from John Hills and Rath. Politicians, probably more mixed on economic policy than you'd think. Second, annuities, not the same as a bank account. But the big lesson, while Janet Yellen was a trailblazer at the Federal Reserve, Joe's mom is the same in the kitchen. She's upstairs now using Jello and some walnuts to make a dessert that defies gravity. It's a culinary revolution up there. And I thought last night when she made sloppy Joe's with a mix from a can was mind-blowing. Thanks to John Hilsenrath for joining us today. You can dig more into Janet Yellen and how economics work in his book, Yellen, the trailblazing economist who navigated an era of upheaval. How about this? We'll do you a solid and also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of the Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. It's culinary now, Pulitzer and culinary. Pul- pu- Pulitzer and culinary. I, isn't it culinary? It's I mean, culinary. Maybe if you're from Minnesota. I, I don't. Have either of you guys been to Northwestern for a football game? Never have been. I've been in the stadium, but not during a game. I just okay. went in it during a tour. You know, it's in Evanston, which is kind of a suburb of Chicago. And from what- Where Doc G lives. Yeah. Why don't you just give him his address? <laughs> From what I understand, the folks that live in the city are not really fond of the stadium being there, and Northwestern is raising $800 million to build a new stadium. They want it to be a more, you know, right now it's just football, you know, just six times a year for a home football game, and that's it. They want it to be for concerts, and the folks who live in the area are pretty fired up about that. <clears throat> but I found this part of the Wall Street Journal article particularly interesting to, and I thought you guys would like to hear this uh, or be a part of it. What they're talking about is the community that's around the stadium. They're really worried about, hey, you know, concert goes on till midnight. They're going to serve booze. There's going to be, you know, 
it's it's already a mess on Saturdays. Now you're going to tell us it's a, you know, three, four day a week type affair. Uh, they quote a person who is a owner of a business there says, Mr. Starkman, who is 56, said complaints about fans urinating on lawns and bushes after games are exaggerated and generally only happen when Northwestern hosts Ohio State. Yes. Oh Wisconsin God, fans party me? very hard. Yes. Here we go. Wisconsin fans party very hard, but, quote, are nice and respectful, he said. Michigan State fans are, quote, brilliant with lots of judges and doctors. Okay, Duh. that's a little false. What? Duh. No, probably good. Michigan supporters are, quote, ruffians, yes. but generally well-behaved. Yeah. Iowa are the friendliest in the Big Ten, and Nebraska's fans are the most likely to arrive in pickups. <laughs> quote, Ohio State fans are the only problem, Mr. Starkman said. Quote, they have a monster following, and they think the world is their bathroom. Asked about that, Ohio State declined to comment. You know why they were out peeing behind the building when they oh, called? God, couldn't have been a better Wall Street Journal article about this. That's fantastic. I'm donating to the Northwestern Stadium as we speak. How do you even make that quote? Like, how do you seriously, you know, you got the Wall Street Journal in front of you and you're going school by school. Yeah. I just like how the author decided to put it all in there. That's yeah. right. And the editors let it go. Yeah. You've been here a long time. What do you, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about the football games? Well, you know, the Wisconsin fans are pretty rowdy, but they're, they're nice. And Michigan States, that's pretty, Michigan's a uh, crazy, but they're generally, you know, who's the troublemakers. <laughs> 